Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, a recent poll showed that 78% of people now feel that they have to walk on eggshells when they're discussing certain issues. That poll was part of a launch of a new campaign called the Campaign for Common Sense. And I'm delighted that I'm joined today by the founder and director of it, Mark Lehane. Hi, Thank Peter. you, Mark. Thanks for having me in. Um, campaign for Common Sense, why? I suppose it comes from uh, a feeling I've had growing over the last few years, uh, where my background is education. I'm a third generation teacher. Um, teaching is in my blood, and I've worked with young people on and off for sort of all 17 years or so. Yeah. But I've had a growing feeling that across a whole range of issues, um, it didn't matter how good we made our schools, because I've, I've been really lucky to be involved in school improvement and school reform for over a decade. It didn't matter how good we make our schools, too many young people are going off to university or into the world of work and suddenly finding all that freedom of thought and knowledge that we've encouraged them to amass, they can't use because there's an expectation they think a certain way, they speak a certain way. And I just think it's reached a point where it's not actually bringing people together, the kind of political correctness, if you want to call it, it's actually forcing people apart. Mm. And I was sort of moaning to someone about it over a coffee and they said to me, well, what are you gonna do about it? And, um, and here I am, I kind of yeah. felt moved to do something. Well, how do people get involved with it? I mean, what, what actually will, how will it operate? Can you just tell us, what, this is a campaign, so, so, so what do you do? What will you do? So really what we want to be is try and be a sort of a sensible grown-up voice in the debates around lots of these sensitive, tricky issues. Mm -hmm. So it could be around the stuff we're seeing in the news at the moment about historical statues, identity politics, stuff around the transgender rights thing, or more general sort of political correctness in the workplace or in the culture and media. And what we want to try and do is rather than just wade in mm -hmm. with an opinion, we want mm -hmm. to do research, mm -hmm. we want to poll people to find out what the public genuinely think. Uh, we might want to go and do some focus groups or hold some events so we can talk to real people across the country and then use what we learn from those people to inform our contribution to the debate. Because I think one of the things we often have is activists on both sides of issues try and convince everyone else that they're the only people that are right and that mm. the other side are nasty. Mm. And actually our approach is going to be there's probably a lot of common ground on all of these issues and where we disagree, we can disagree nicely. So in terms of how people can get involved, we're encouraging people to go to our website, read our launch report, subscribe to our email updates on what we're doing. Uh, the website is campaigncommonsense.com. Right. Uh, if they go along there, it's very easy. They can just put their email address in, we'll keep them up to date, and we're gonna build things from there. Will you sort of have meetings and things, uh, you know, or events, things like that? Yes, that's right. And, and, and so obviously we'll do the usual kind of stuff in the world of Westminster and in, and in, and in London, because there's a lot of stuff going on there. But most importantly, we do want to be doing events around the country. We mm. want to take this to the real world and you know, not just the London bubble. Yeah, good. Um, I think it's something like 84% uh, of people in your poll thought that there should be more common sense mm. abroad in, 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 in Britain. Um, what actually would you, how would you define common sense that's a what, really, is it, what is it to you? Now that's a really good question to ask, and lots of people have asked us, what do you mean by common sense? And particularly people have asked us that if they're very sceptical about what we're trying to do. But for us, when we're talking about common sense, we really mean some of those widely held truths that the general public or the vast majority of people would hold to be the case. Yeah. That's not to say it's an eternal truth. Indeed, one of our sort of founding statements is, that we don't believe anyone has a monopoly on right or wrong necessarily. Right. But for us, by common sense, what we mean is those overwhelmingly, those overwhelming understandings that the vast majority of people hold to be true, they might evolve over time, but they're most things, they're things that most people can identify with. And our concern is that with the rise of sort of what some people would call political correctness, this common sense has kind of been pushed to the edges yeah. when making policy or decisions, and it's been replaced by specific interests for minority activists, people with a very passionate, strongly held belief, mm. but they're not views or beliefs that are held by the majority of people, and they've replaced the sort of common sense, widely held truths that the majority hold. You, you, you mentioned actually as well that in the survey that in fact, you know, there are these various numbers, large numbers of people who just want politicians to be concerned with public sort of services and things like that, isn't that right? As opposed to sort of if you minority interests, is that right? Yeah, so we've been through a really, we've been through a really interesting, or we're still going through 
a really interesting time, aren't we, with coronavirus? Mm -hmm. And we polled, we did a poll with over 2,000 people just a few weeks ago about what the impact of coronavirus was on, what they thought government should focus on. And just under 80% of people felt that because of the crisis we're going through, the government should now prioritise common sense approaches to things mm. rather than, uh, and, public, and public services rather than political correctness. Mm. So as someone said to me, you know, maybe if the government had spent more time focusing on pandemic preparation mm. than policing Twitter or telling people what pronouns they should use, mm. we might have been in a better position when coronavirus reared its ugly head earlier on this year. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's also, isn't it, the case that uh, quite a few people uh, expressed opinions about, to be completely up to date, uh, the issue of statues and things. You, you actually had this in your report, didn't you, but long before this issue actually has come up in the way that it has now. Yeah, so when we were doing our polling um, to try and understand where public opinion was and what issues were particularly pertinent, we did ask people stuff around historical statues. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a big issue in the UK at the time. It's been a much bigger issue in the United States for a while. But we did ask people about that. And interestingly enough, when we asked people what should you do with controversial statues, mm -hmm. um, just over 60% of people felt we should preserve them, leave them where they are and learn from them rather than remove them. Mm -hmm. Now. We put that on our launch report because it's an interesting topic. We didn't think it would be so hot button. Mm. And literally in the last week or so, we've really seen it rise up. Mm. And again, I saw a poll earlier on this week done by YouGov about the statue that was pulled down in the docks in Bristol. Bristol yeah. And they found that only 13% of people thought that pulling it down was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. There was a small majority of people that thought it should have been removed, but through legitimate means. Um, but only a tiny proportion of people felt that was the right way to go about it. And again, think about that. There'd been a really well-organised um, movement in Bristol in recent years to try and remove that particular statue through legitimate means. Mm. And when that mob went down to the docks and pulled that statue down and stuck it in the water, they made a mockery of the hard work and the legitimate moves that all those people have done over years. And it's just really not fair. It, it really, this kind of thing really upsets the broader public mm. because it cuts across that very strong sense we have in this country of fair play. Yeah, I mean, fair play, but also presumably as well, you know, many of the people who respond to your, your survey would feel very angry generally about what's happening, you know, in terms of, you know, cultural uh, criticism, increasing sort of like a, what appear to be attacks on, you know, street names and yeah. all of these things. I would have thought that that would have been a very mainstream feeling. Well, well, it is. Again, when we did our polling, we found that um, around about four and five people felt that there was a blame culture in this country that was making certain issues worse. Um, four and five felt they had to walk on eggshells mm. around certain issues. Mm, mm. They wanted to engage in issues. They wanted to understand what people that held different views from them thought, mm. but they were really nervous that if they tried to wade into those discussions, they might use the wrong terminology or be perceived to say the wrong thing, and then they'd be called out by a mob. And actually two thirds of people told us that they felt the political correctness was actually making things worse. Right. You know, now political correctness started off as a really good thing. It was about how could we be kinder to one another? Mm. Could we think a little bit more about how we interacted with one another and the words we use to be more sensitive? And over time, sadly, it's been politicised and it's grown into a movement that's trying to tell people not just what to say, but what to think. Mm -hmm. And people can tell what's going on. Mm -hmm. People aren't happy about that. They're finding it repressive. And it's really important that I point out here, this is not like a white middle-aged right-wing bloke thing. Mm -hmm. We could see from our polling that there was a majority support for the kind of concerns that we were examining mm. from people all across the country, from all across the political spectrum and all age groups. So this can't be pinned down to like a, you know, a gammon type issue. These right. are mainstream views held by the majority of people. The challenge is why aren't more of our political leaders and our cultural leaders stepping up to the mark and addressing it? Why do you think that is? So I think part of it is a concern, a fear of being called out mm. by the activists. Mm. I think there is a fear of the mob, um, and I completely understand mm. that fear. I mean, one of the things that um, I suppose radicalised me to think about these, these issues, bearing in mind education is my background, mm. was to see what happened just over a year ago to Sir Roger Scruton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for, um, people watching this you know, won't necessarily know, but Roger was involved in um, my previous organisation, Parents and Teachers for Excellence, we're oh, an education yes. campaign group. Yeah, yeah. He was a really wise guy 
a really great source of advice and wisdom. We had him on the show actually last yeah, week. What yeah, what a lovely guy. And then to see him dragged through that mm, mm. when he was trying to do a good thing, mm. to see the way the then government treated him, mm, mm. Um, and then for it to all happen just before he fell very, very ill, that was appalling. Mm. We shouldn't let stuff like that happen. Mm. And, and for me, one of the things we start, we're at risk of forgetting um, in these sorts of debates is that just because, even if, even if Roger had held the views that were ascribed to him, even though he didn't, even if he had, we mustn't forget the fact that there are loads of people in this country that, don't, that share views that maybe a few years ago were okay, mm. but are not now mainstream, and we wouldn't necessarily advocate those views mm. now. But we can't just write them off. Mm. We can't write off previous generations. We can't write off people from particular backgrounds, because there's more to life than just the views mm. people hold. There's mm. things like friendship, and love and common interest with colleagues and so on and so forth. And I think if we bring everything down to politics and whether or not people hold the right kind of views, in the end, we're all gonna fall out. None of us will focus on what we've got in common. And that is not a way to have a happy, fulfilled society. I mean, how do you think broadly, how do you think we ended up in this position? I mean, where basically people feel what used to be called, if you like, the silent majority feel, you know, that, that basically they can't really say what they think or all the things that are in your survey. How do we end up at that situation? So I think part of it is just that um, all of these really well-meaning initiatives yeah. to try and make life more sensitive and inclusive, um, lots of them have ended up being counterproductive and they've been subvertive and they've ended up pushing people apart. Mm. Um, so absolutely, we should try and watch what we're saying when we're debating ideas with people to try and be more sensitive, that's now potentially in a lot of areas slipped over into policing exactly what mm, people mm. can and can't say. But on a more practical level, I think the reason why this movement has been able to get where it is in terms of um, the slightly authoritarian wokiness, to call it mm -hmm. what you like, I think it's because most people are getting on with their day jobs. Yeah. They're earning a living. They want to keep a roof over their family's heads and provide for their friends and family. They're too busy getting on with the real world to look at what's been going on in some important cultural institutions, be it our universities, our legal system, the political system and stuff like that. And so what it's meant is that decisions in those places have increasingly over time been made not to reflect and support and underpin broader common society, yeah. but actually to, to um, reflect the interests of those a activists that have been involved in those institutions. Mm. So minority activists have been able to push their views, mm. uh, and then it's been easier for those institutions to over time gradually accommodate those views and then hold those views themselves, whilst the rest of us are getting on with our day job. I don't think it's been done deliberately. It's just how um, values change through society. Mm. And, and let's not forget, lots of really good stuff has mm. come over the years as, as societies have progressed mm. and we've adopted hopefully more enlightened values um, and that's only happened because really inspiring people have started off pushing ideas that were initially minority views and have now become mainstream accepted views so it's, it's not in and of itself a bad thing but it's just I think some bad ideas have taken over in recent times. You, you were a teacher as you've mentioned yeah. you know uh, 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 what has your experience been in the teaching, you mentioned universities there, but in schools, I think this is a flashpoint for many people. Um, you know, have you found that there is a kind of groupthink mentality in, in schools? I mean, if you are not of a certain point of view, maybe say take soft left or hard left, I guess even, if you're, if you're more conservative, you know, is there, you know, are you beleaguered? So there's, there's no doubt um, that the teaching profession in this country is generally of a sort of centre-left mm. um, orientation mm. Mm. and the overwhelming majority of people in there um, hold the kind of views you would, you would ascribe to that. Now, mm. I don't personally, as a sort of centre-right, I guess I identify with the Conservative Party and I'm small c conservative generally in my values. I don't have a problem with that per se because actually when you get into a classroom and you're working with kids, overwhelmingly your personal politics and philosophy don't, don't come into it. Yeah. Mm. But where it is starting to creep in is, and, and probably has done for a long time but it's become more visible in recent years, is around the pastoral uh, support that right. we're giving pupils right. and um, and in some subject areas it's starting to creep in where various teachers and teacher training institutions and other educators are pushing for for instance the what they call the decolonization of the curriculum they want what we teach the children 
to not be sort of, you know, at island story and teaching kids um, the common history that we have mm. as citizens of the United Kingdom now, but to teach kids a particular version of that, mm. and in particular version that, that the sort of radical left would identify more with. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, all kids going through school now will examine uh, the British Empire mm -hmm. and the history of the British Empire, and indeed, you know, a lot of the damage that the British Empire did and lots of the terrible things that were done in its name as mm. well as the, the upsides, but there's been a greater movement in recent years, again, mm. by a small minority of teachers to make that even more radical. Mm. Um, but around the pastoral side of things, you'll probably remember last year, uh, last summer, there were some protests outside some schools in Birmingham mm. about the kind of sex education yeah, that, yeah. that the schools were yeah. rolling out. And there was some concern by some parents in the community about the kind of sex ed that was being taught. I have to say, I, I, I was with the school on that issue in terms of how they were going about that. Mm. But what I did find concerning was the general tone with which the teaching profession spoke about the community in question. It was quite dismissive. Mm -hmm. It was quite anti the concerns those parents held. And I think we, we have to remember as public servants, we're there to serve our communities and we have to bear their concerns in mind, not dismiss them. So what we're starting to see in schools around, for instance, the, trans, the transgender kid mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. and working with children that, that maybe think they identify to a different sex than the one they're born to, I think those kind of things are starting to bubble up in schools now. Mm -hmm. Um, like as part of the wider culture wars mm. and I think we need to be really mindful about how we go about dealing with that because mm. if we're not careful the kind of angry debates that we've seen in broader society will end up in our schools and I don't think that will do anyone any good. Oh no, I mean we've seen just uh, quite recently uh, JK Rowling, mm. you know, getting monstered basically by actually her her former stars of, her, you know, of the movies, Harry Potter movies. And actually there was a school yesterday, it was on the BBC News site, I saw there was a school in Sussex that wrote out to all of its families yesterday to announce that one of the school houses that was going to be named after J.K. Rowling yes. would no longer be named after J.K. Rowling because the head teacher felt that what she'd said was transphobic. Now, that is entirely the school's right to do that. Mm. You know, I think as a head teacher you have to run the school as you see fit. However, I think that's a really problematic decision that that head teacher's made. Because, first of all, there's nothing in what J.K. Rowling said that the vast majority of the population would disagree with in mm. terms of the, the blog she'd written and the tweets she's done. Mm. Um, I think she's taken a very sensitive, a very empathetic approach mm. to the issue. But more worrying was um, in the letter that the head teacher sent out, they, they tried to claim that they weren't taking a view on this mm. issue and that mm. they were just being inclusive. Mm. And actually, they clearly come down on one side of that issue, it's not a majority held opinion. I, um, if I recall from our polling, uh, something like 61% uh, of people felt that when it came to transgender rights, um, we'd either gone too far in this country yeah. already or had it about right. About right yeah. So there was no majority view to shift things. No, no, you know. So that's a good example of where someone in the public sector has made a decision which they think is a right decision. It's out of kilter with wider public opinion. And it's also clearly a very political decision they've made. And I just think if I was a kid in that school or a mm. member of staff in that school yeah. that held a different opinion to that, their ability to express that opinion has now been completely suppressed. Yeah. And these are not issues where the debate's been had and done with. These are sensitive issues mm. that we're still working our way through. And I don't think we should shut down that kind of discussion. That, that's the point, actually, isn't it? I mean, you, you talk about the public sector, but then in that case, as well, body shop have piled mm. in, haven't they, on, on top of... Uh, J.K. Rowling and uh, very dismissively, actually, and uh, very rough. But you see, so you can absolutely understand, can't you, why people who are in that 61%, for example, how they sort of feel that even though they're in the majority, they sort of think, this is what's going to happen if I actually, what if I say something out of turn? This, this is what might happen. Okay, they won't get, you know, a name changed on the street or something. It's not the same situation, but it's it basically just you know, brings about a certain kind of attitude, doesn't it? You sort of think, actually, I better keep my mouth, you know, walk on eggshells. And, and what's been really insightful and actually quite worrying is the number of people that have got in touch with us since we launched the campaign yeah. a few weeks ago to yeah. say, you know, thank you for doing this. I wish I could speak out about X or Y, but I didn't. Mm. You know, even if they wanted to do it in their own time, on their own social media or whatever, their worry is that they will be reported to their employers mm. or called out at, at, at you know, organisations they work with and then they won't be able to take part in it. Yes. And it's such a shame because there is such a positive message to sell about all of this, which mm. is in this country we have a huge amount in common 
Mm. We share an awful mm. lot in common, even around supposedly contentious issues. Mm. We've got a really good track record in this country of either muddling our way through or coming to um, a consensus about yeah. how we should deal with things. And, and I think we should be really proud of that. That's not to say there isn't more we can do, but actually most people have got an awful lot in common with, with other people. And even where we disagree, we've got a really good track record in this country of disagreeing really nicely, resolving our differences through democratic means or other means and getting on with one another. What would success look like then for you with this campaign? I mean, what would you consider to be uh, I know you, you've been tweeting some things lately, but have you managed to effect any sort of change? Or what would, what would your idea be of, oh, that's actually a little victory? You know, that's a good little victory. Yeah, so obviously no one organisation or one person is going to change things themselves. And actually this is really about what would success be if more people felt that they were able to speak their mind, yeah, yeah. help other people, try and do the right thing and not yeah. have to worry about inadvertently offending someone or upsetting someone yeah. okay and then being and then facing consequences because of that um, there was a lovely thing yesterday uh, again it's on Twitter and Twitter is not the real life I get that yeah. there's a lovely thing yesterday oh, <laughs> where um, some wallies on Twitter had re tried to report an academic to the University of Reading who, who, sh who she worked for uh, because she'd come out in the, uh, the academic had come out in favor of Black Lives Matter and said that she was really glad that that statue had come down. Mm. And some people tried to report her to the University of Reading and they rightly said, no, academic freedom, they can hold their views and we will back them. Mm. And then I sort of jumped in and said, well, I, you know, I hope the University of Reading, and Reading's my hometown, so I've got an interest here. Yeah. I hope they'll support people that held other views like pro-Brexit views or try gender critical views or what have you. And their official Twitter account came back and said, of course we would, academic freedom is for everyone on all issues and all views. Now. If we could get more universities coming out and stating that and living by that, mm. more companies, more organisations that could come out and say that, then we'd all be much better off because we don't have to agree. The mm. body shop can hold their view, that's fine. Um, so long as they don't then enforce that view on their staff or their customers, then we can all muddle along and get on. So that to me would be success. People feeling they can step out, engage with their friends, family in real life mm. and not have to worry if they've inadvertently upset someone. Well, look, I hope you have successes in that case, you know? I mean, I really do. And, and do you, how, so you did mention how people could get involved. Can you tell us what the website is again? Yeah, sure. So our website is at campaigncommonsense.com. Okay. And if people go there, yeah. there's a join us form on the front page. Yeah. We're not going to harass them with loads of emails. It just means we can keep them in touch with what we're doing. And most importantly, if we see good, good stuff going on, good news stories, we can share them with people. Right. And if we need to mobilise people to try and get involved in some other stuff, we can let them know at short notice. Well, that's great. Well, look, thank you very much for coming on, Mark. Thanks very much. Thanks and um, actually, our first in a long time socially distanced <laughs> guest. We are actually at quite a distance, aren't we? Um, thanks very much. That's it for So What You're Saying is this, this week, and uh, we will see you next week. And I hope you have a nice time in the meantime. Thank you. <laughs>